of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, eternal goodness, immeasurable love, you place your gifts before us. We eat and are satisfied. Fill us in this world with all that it needs, with the life that comes from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Exodus. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall, you shall know I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew was lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a f fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord.
stand as you are comfortable for the Holy Gospel. saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were beside the sea, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Humanity will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. And they said to him then, what must we do to perform the works of God? 
And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you faith in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what signs are you going to give us then so that we may see it and faith you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever faiths in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. When I was in seminary, I took a course that was just preaching the gospel of John, because while John is my favorite gospel writer by a wide margin, he's also the one that confuses me the most, and the thought of needing to preach him intimidated me. Because like, John will say all of these words, and it's it's not even like they're words that I don't know. The sentences themselves will make sense to me, but I still feel like something is happening in the passage that I'm just not getting. Like there's some additional meaning just gently flapping over my head that I can't quite reach. And instead of that just out of reachness being off-putting, for me at least, it's always just made me more enamored with John's gospel. Speaking in riddles again, eh, John? That's okay. The crowds Jesus is speaking to seem perpetually confused by what he's saying, so I guess I have company. And I get like 80% of what you're saying, I think, and I like this 80% and hope to one day figure out that other 20. And that was all very well and good when I was just reading it to myself, but then I have to preach it and just shoot. So I quickly learned that the major problem with following what John is talking about, the root cause of that just out of reachness, is that John loved wordplay and puns and would use them constantly. But while English is all obviously a very flexible language and full of its own puns and stuff, it's actually really, really hard to translate a pun into another language. The wordplay rarely lines up in the same way in both languages, so you just can't. So translators have this reoccurring issue throughout all of John where they can either give you the literal or the figurative phrasing but can't do both or at least can't do them well. So yeah, there's often stuff hovering just out of reach. It's the other half of all of these puns and things that John was deploying. And on top of that, John intended for the entire gospel to be heard from one end to the other in a single sitting. So the further you get into the fourth gospel, the more throwbacks and allusions he makes to themes and events from earlier in the story. And if you hadn't read those previous chapters recently, those throwback references are going to pass right over you. So far in the story, Jesus has only performed two signs, two miracles. He turned water into wine at the wedding in Cana, and then he, just the night before, multiplied loaves and fishes for the feeding of the 5,000. Both of these miracles were times when people around him were distressed, and Jesus demonstrated God's abundant love, not in abstract words, but in immediate and tangible ways that address their needs. So it would be clear to all of us, if we'd read every part of the story up to this point, how kind of out of place and extreme the crowd's request in this story is. 
because a lot of events happen between Jesus' first sign and his second one. And in that time, in between those two, many people came to trust that he's the Messiah without any signs, just by conversations they had with him and the things he's teaching. And the second happened less than 24 hours before this. And the folks who are talking to him witnessed that sign. And yet here they are asking him for another one. And before they can even speak on the matter, before they can even ask about it, Jesus reveals that he knows exactly why they are here. And he says it is not, in fact, that they saw this sign and in it they recognized the abundant love of God and wanted to experience it again. No, Jesus says that it's because they ate their fill of the bread, and they want the bread again. And let's be clear, Jesus is not saying that feeding the hungry is bad. Obviously, doing so is something he supports, because he just did that less than 24 hours ago. No, he's scolding them, because they saw this miraculous thing and didn't view it beyond this surface-level point of just having their physical needs met. They are among the few that have seen an entire sign from Jesus, and yet it caused no spiritual movement in them. And Jesus says, hey friends, don't make a habit of that. It's not that the surface level is bad, but you are still missing the point. I was trying to feed you spiritually too, and it seems like you kind of missed that part. And in the crowd's defense, they do seem to be receptive to that gentle scolding. Okay, Jesus, then what do we need to do to be doing the works of God, to be having this kind of spiritual growth and movement that you hoped for from us? And then Jesus answers, and his answer contains one of my biggest frustrations with English translations of John, because I personally think that the entire meaning of this sentence changes depending on how you translate one small word. And this is Jesus' answer telling us what we must do to perform the works of God. So, like, it's probably really important that we get the words right, yeah? So here's the problem. In Greek, the word faith can be both a noun and a verb. Now, remember back to grade school, a noun is a person, place, a thing, or an idea. And a verb is the action word of a sentence. It's what the person, place, thing, or idea is doing. Anyhow, in Greek, faith can be both a noun and a verb, but in English it is only a noun. And we can easily test that that's true, in case that was a head-scratcher. She is running. That's a whole sentence right there, real simple. She is our noun, that's the person. What is she doing? She's running. There is our verb. Now we could try the same sentence again. She is faithing. That's not really a sentence, is it? In English, we do not conceptualize faith as an action, as a thing you do. We conceptualize it as a thing or an idea, as something you have. And that makes it tricky to translate several passages throughout John because he talks about this doing sort of faith quite a lot. And one of those times is here in Jesus' answer, because the more literal response of Jesus is what I said out loud and not what is printed in your bulletin. This is the work of God that you faith in him whom he has sent. And that led translators to this weird kind of existential crisis where they had to ask themselves, okay, so like, what does it mean to do faith? How would I go about articulating this concept of faithing to an English speaker. I want to make sure they understand that this is an action they're doing and not a commodity they should try to obtain. And yes, traditionally they settled on believe, which isn't a wrong translation necessarily. Like, we can all see how belief can be a way of doing faith. But belief carries a connotation of its own in English that isn't quite right and isn't there in Greek. Because belief means that things hang on you, doesn't it? Belief can be undermined by questions or doubt. Even if you don't want to feel that way and desperately want your doubts to go away, if they're there, they're there, and there's kind of not a whole lot you can do about that, is there? 
Belief isn't even something you can always have any active control over. Belief makes it sound like this whole assignment of doing the works of God falls squarely on you, and if you hesitate, if you question or doubt, you have failed in your mission and aren't doing what Jesus requires of you. And all of this is at odds with this basic premise of our faith, the idea that it's not up to what you do or don't do, it's up to God and God's abundant love and grace fully given to you. And so some other more modern day translators thought it over and they went, hey, the Greek form for faith contains absolutely none of those connotations. There's none of that tension between faith and doubt in Greek. There's certainly no implication that like something as minor as a compulsive thought could undo or cancel this faith in action. Belief is not inherently a bad translation, but it's going to give people the wrong idea. We can do better. So let's try it again. What does it mean to do faith? And the answer that they gave was one of the most life-giving bits of theology I have ever encountered. They said to do faith is to trust. And you can say, okay, trust and believe sound very similar. And they are, but I think back to this time I was in the high school play and my character needed to scream and throw herself backwards and the other characters nearby would catch her. And All of them were my friends. The first day we did that scene, we had to repeat my collapse for about 30 minutes before we'd fully coordinated exactly which people were catching me and they got the technique down. During this time, my friends caught me maybe 10% of the time overall. And we'd go again and I would scream and throw myself back, trusting that they would catch me. Did I believe they would catch me though? Absolutely not. I'd be grimacing and preparing to hit the floor each time. But even though I believed they would fail at their task, I still trusted that they wouldn't and went forward. Or I guess in this case backwards, regardless. And it's like that in our faith lives too. We can partially or even fully believe that God has abandoned us or doesn't care or isn't real or whatever else our doubts may say. We can believe that and yet still trust that that isn't the case and continuing following after Jesus, even as our intrusive thoughts are full of questions and doubt and unbelief. These are not mutually exclusive ideas. Jesus says we are to do faith. What could be more faithful than continuing on your path, even with that little voice whispering anxieties to you? This, then, is the work of God, that you trust in him whom he has sent. And I don't know about the rest of you, but that task is a whole lot easier for me to do than believing. Yes, Jesus, I trust you fully and completely. I don't always understand what's going on, and I'm often worried about what's ahead or think things are about to blow up in my face. But I trust you. And I rejoice that today Jesus says that that is all he asks of me, just a trust fall. He is the bread of life. Whoever comes to him will never be hungry, and whoever trusts in him will never be thirsty. All he asks is that you show up and follow him. He will figure out the rest for you. A trust fall right into the loving embrace of the maker of the cosmos where you'll be caught and cradled every time, even if you're muttering mutinously in the process. That's not so very hard of a task. And yes, in case you are wondering, every single time the word belief shows up in John, it's this doing faith word. And every time you see it, you can quietly swap the word trust in its place. Try it sometime. See how different some of those passages feel. So I leave us today with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever trusts in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. And for this good news we rejoice. Amen.
Please stand as you are comfortable. to guide our hearts and our minds, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. O oh, wise one, your wisdom has been present in this world since its beginning. Pour out your wisdom into the hearts of the whole church, especially the newly baptized, lay leaders, deacons, pastors, and bishops. Merciful God, Holy God of all creation, you are the source of all life. Where the sun blazes hard and strong, bring a gentle breeze. In the places experiencing the cold of winter, bring your warmth. Merciful God, compassionate God, help govern, government leaders of this world unite for peace and justice. Humble all who hold authority, that power is directed toward a more just society, especially in Cameroon, Central African Republic, and Equatorial Guinea. Merciful God, bread of life from heaven, you feed us. Fill all who hunger with needed nutrition and open our hearts to eliminate hunger in this world. May we see a day when all are fed. We also pray for those we name now, whether silently or aloud. Hold them all close in your tender embrace. Merciful God, 
Redeeming God, we give you thanks for the lives and witness of your saints now departed. Bring your beloved into eternal glory, opening wide the gates to the heavenly banquet. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift up these prayers to you, gracious God. Receive them into your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. Well, everybody's already mostly sitting down. If the kids want to join me in the back for children's sermon, we can do that. Or we also don't have to. Hey, guys. So this week is the... Can one of the grown-ups help me out and, like, what week is this in the church calendar? It's on the front of your bulletins, everybody. How many weeks after Pentecost is it? 11? Yay! Lexi, do you wanna help move the church calendar? You don't have to. I can get another volunteer. I think we are. One more. There we go. Awesome. So a lot of the church year, we spend just counting after Pentecost, and sometimes I get lost at how far ahead that is. How are you guys doing today? Oh. So today, all of the grown-ups, we're talking a lot about trusting and believing and how we show each other love and appreciation. And so what I thought might be a fun task for you guys to do, if you would like, is to help draw more pictures for some of our art exhibits out in front of the sanctuary so we can hang them up. And I have all sorts of paper. I was wondering if you guys could draw some things for me that make you happy. And then we can put them up and then everybody can go, what great artists we have in the church. And I think that would be really fun. What do you guys say? Do you want a piece of paper? I'm just gonna leave papers here for everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I hope you guys have fun and I really hope to get all of your pictures after church. Yeah. Thank you guys. Well, it's good to be worshiping with you all here today. I can't believe it, it was 11, right? 11 Sundays after Pentecost, and we're still counting. And so um, a very special thank you um, to Vicki for being here with us today. Um, you might remember her as one of our um, interns, what, a year or more ago now? Something like that. Um, and so it's good to have her back preaching with us today. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, I just want to extend a very special welcome to you today and to let you know that wherever you are on your spiritual or religious journey, you are welcome here in this place. So that we can get a chance to welcome you even more robustly, I want to get a chance to direct your attention to the link on the QR code that is either on the screen or is in your bulletin. If you follow that link in QR code, it's gonna take you over to our digital connect card. And there's also a physical connect card in the pew in front of you. 
We would love to have you just check off that you're here visiting today. You can put it in the offering plate or hit submit. And we're just going to reach out, share a little bit more about Wicker Park Lutheran Church. Um, if you'd like to, we're going to offer the opportunity to get together, have a drink, um, coffee, Zoom call, all on us. We'll pay for it all um, just to get a chance to know you a bit more and answer any questions you have about our community. That is an opportunity, not an obligation, um, but know that we are here and excited um, to engage with you. Following the dismissal today in this space, our service continues in the fellowship hall as it does each Sunday. This is a time of conversation and snacks. It's a time where we get to embody our faith and get to know one another. Because ours is an ever-changing community, don't be afraid to reach out to somebody new, introduce yourself, um, and uh, just enjoy our time together. So too today, um, after a bit of time of uh, fellowship, we'll make an announcement, and then at the far end of the fellowship hall, we're going to have what's called Stories from Synod Assembly. So at the beginning of June, we had two of our members who went to the Synod Assembly, which is basically a gathering of a whole bunch of different congregations across the metro Chicago area. And what they do is they talk a bit about uh, ministry that we're doing and what that looks like in our geography. And so those two members are going to be there today, getting a chance to just share a bit about what that was like in June. So join us either in person or we will be live streaming that as well um, in our Zoom room. There'll be a link and a QR code on the screen afterwards so that you can follow and join us for that time of conversation. So too, um, in just a few weeks, on August 15th, we're going to be hosting a movie in the park at uh, Wicker Park. And so this is an opportunity where we get a chance to share a bit about our congregation. We also have an opportunity to share some snacks with people. And also, if you want to stick around and watch the movie, great. We have a few volunteer opportunities to help create the booth, to help staff the booth, more information is in your bulletin. You can also um, put on the Connect card, Movies in the Park, and we'll reach out to you. You can sign up to help staff that, um, but we'd love to um, have you join us for that time. So too, our um, bags of love, we're beginning to gather items. We just, today somebody brought in all the toothpaste that we need um, for this, which is great, um, but we're continuing to gather items or monetary donations for our Bags of Love, which is our God's Work, Our Hands Sunday project. So the second Sunday of September, we're going to put these bags together that have toothbrush, toothpaste, combs, uh, washer detergent, all that kind of stuff in it, and then we'll invite you to take those bags along with information about where people can get food and homeless shelters and give it to maybe somebody that you see as you're getting off the expressway or near the L or somebody that you notice outside of a business. Um, and this gives you an opportunity, instead of having to turn away, you can move towards them and have a conversation and get a chance to engage with them. So we're going to put those bags together September 8th. We're hoping to have all the items and money donated by September 1st. Um, so we've got about a little bit less than a month for that. And then on that September 8th is also going to be our block party. So we're going to have a whole bunch of events. We're hoping to release some more information about ways you can volunteer for that um, over this next week. So get a chance to keep an eye out for that as well. The final announcement that I have is just to remind you that those of you who are having giving conversations, if you've been asked to have a conversation about the A Place for All Capital campaign, if you still are waiting to turn your pledge form in, this is our opportunity as we're kind of wrapping up our internal towards members and current donors conversations. Um, by the end of this month, we're going to be moving into a larger campaign across those who aren't members, those who are in the community. Um, and so we're going to be sharing a bit more information about that. The final Sunday here in August, we're going to be gathering to get an update on where construction process is coming, um, what we're doing for our permit documents, where permits are coming along, also to talk about what we've raised so far, as well as give you all some information that you can talk to friends and family and stuff like that to share a little bit about the conversation and see, you know, every dollar is a dollar closer um, to making it a reality. So um, just a reminder that we're continuing um, to move forward with that capital campaign. There are a whole number of other announcements in your bulletin. Get a chance to check them out and check out the e-newsletter as well. In just a few, a few moments, we're going to gather here at the table of Holy Communion. This is where that bread of life is given for us each and every week. 
And the important thing to know is it's not my table or a Lutheran table, but all of you are welcome to this holy table. All of our bread is gluten-free and we have both wine and juice available. Get a chance to see in your bulletin how we take that by a continuous process here at Wicker Park. And now we have an opportunity to give of our offerings, not because we earn our way to the table, but rather because we have an opportunity to pause and reflect on the ways that God has worked through us and continues to work through us. The ways that we can trust God and know that God is moving among us. And so I invite you to reflect on the gifts you've already given, electronically or otherwise, or to give in the plate or electronically now. Knowing that a portion of all that you give goes not only um, to support the work here, as the majority does, but that portion goes to our ministry partners across the city, across the globe, to respond to hunger, to walk alongside those who are in fear, and to also liberate those who feel oppressed. So get a chance to reflect on those gifts today, either that you have already given or that you give now. Please stand as you are comfortable. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, 
through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and the suffering, who preached good news to the poor and the outcast, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which Christ was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and then gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Eat of this often in remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this cup often in remembrance of me. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O God, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now gathered together by the Spirit's motherly care, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Please stand as you are comfortable. As you go forth this day, go with this blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, who feeds us and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever. Amen. Peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.